Hey everybody, welcome back to my channel. First thing, I need to apologize. I am filming during a different time of day than I normally do. There are dogs barking. I think I even heard someone start up their lawnmower, which we are in Indiana and it is January. The grass doesn't need mowed. I don't know what's going on. So if you hear any of that craziness in the background, I do apologize. If you are new to my channel, hello, my name is Casey and I post videos every single week on missing person cases that need more exposure and maybe haven't been talked about in a while or haven't gotten as much attention as they should have. For the past year, I have posted every Wednesday. That may be changing soon. I will still post at least one video a week, but the day may change due to my work schedule. I don't know yet. We will see. Anyway, thank you for joining me for another missing person case and now we will go ahead and get into it. Today's video is on Colin Gillis. Colin Gillis was born on March the 4th of 1994 to parents John and Patty Gillis. He was raised alongside his older brother Lyndon and his younger brother Ian in the logging town of Tupper Lake, which is a village in Franklin County, New York. Tupper Lake is within the boundaries of the Adirondack Park and had a population of around 3,500 in 2012. Colin sounds like he was an absolutely amazing kid. He had a great sense of humor, was quick-witted, funny, and it said he could sometimes be a smart ass, but he really cared about others and he always wanted to make sure the people he cared about were taken care of. He loved being around his friends and family. He was very talented. He played football and basketball in high school and he was extremely intelligent. He excelled in school and was even able to skip a grade. He graduated from Tupper Lake High School in 2011, and from there, he was accepted into the pre-med program at the State University of New York at Brockport, which was about five hours away from Tupper Lake. Colin wanted to be a doctor, and he was determined to succeed in life. And he most likely would have. In March of 2012, Colin was a freshman at SUNY and he had just turned 18. He was making friends and doing well adjusting to college life. On Friday, March the 9th, classes finished up. It was officially spring break and Colin was excited to go home for a bit. He arrived home in Tupper Lake and on Saturday, March the 10th, the family had dinner together and hung out afterward watching an NCAA basketball game. Colin had plans with friends later that night and he was super excited about it. He could not wait to go out and have some fun and see all of his friends. That evening, Colin put on a white American Eagle t-shirt with blue stripes, a pair of Levi jeans, red high tops, and he grabbed his orange L.L. Bean backpack that had a reversible black and red L.L. Bean coat inside it. Around 8.30 p.m., he told his parents that he would be back later and he left his home to go visit some friends that lived right down the street. He visited there for a bit and then left with friends in their car to go to another residence. And from that residence, he and nine of his friends once again left. They had heard about a party and wanted to go check it out. This party was five miles away at a home on Pascangame Road. This area is pretty rural and secluded, but it's only about three miles from Tupper Lake. There are several houses there but they're pretty far apart and set way back off of the road. The gathering of about 40 people was to celebrate someone's 21st birthday. There would be alcohol there, but Colin and his friends had not been invited to this party. They were not friends with the people at the party either, but they did know some of them, so they went. The good time they were expecting at the party did not go as planned. While there, Colin got into an argument with someone which escalated into an actual physical fight and his friends decided it was time to leave. I am unsure of the time, but the friends thought it would be best to just get out of there before things got really bad. Colin, however, refused to go. For some reason, he was adamant about staying. He was having a good time. And so after not being able to convince him to change his mind, his friends, all nine of them, left. So Colin stayed at this party with a bunch of people that he had never hung out with before. It is unclear if Colin was drinking or not. Okay, side note, I am absolutely not blaming Colin's friends for anything at all, but guys, don't leave your friends at parties. If they came with you, make sure they leave with you. Around 1 a.m., Colin did leave the party. He headed out alone 
on foot going north on Pascamangue Road toward Route 3. For some reason, that is still baffling to this day, when Colin reached the intersection of Pascamangue Road and Route 3, instead of turning right toward his home in Tupper Lake, which would have had him safely back at his house in just a couple miles, he turned left toward the town of Piercefield. Now, there are no streetlights or sidewalks on Route 3. It's not highly traveled that time of night, and it's definitely not somewhere you would want to be walking at night all alone in the cold, especially in the opposite direction of home. Around 1.30 a.m., a teen named Austin Tui, who had been at the party until it ended, was driving his cousin, Jordan Amell, back to her house in Piercefield. They said they saw Colin as he was turning left onto New York 3 from Pascamonge Road. They say they asked him if he wanted a ride, but he declined. He told them that he already had a ride coming. Later, after Austin had dropped Jordan off and was heading back to Tepper Lake, he says he saw Colin still walking along the road, and again, Austin says he stopped to, once more, offer a ride. Colin once again declined. He was seen by another driver walking down a stretch of Route 3 near the Franklin-St. Lawrence County line close to the Adirondack Forest around 1.45 a.m., the driver's name was Rich Rosentretter. I apologize if I am saying that last name wrong, but he didn't stop to offer Colin a ride because he had his elderly mother in the vehicle with him, and understandably, he didn't feel it was a good idea to pick up a stranger in the middle of the night on such a desolate strip of road. He is right. That is a bad idea. Rich was concerned, though, because Colin was walking against traffic really close to the white line at the edge of the road. He wasn't wearing a coat, despite it being below freezing temperatures out, and he appeared to be flailing his arms about. He didn't go back to pick up Colin. He did, however, drive to a police station after dropping his mother off to report what he'd seen because it was suspicious, and he was worried about the person he'd seen because it was so late, and it was such an odd place for someone to be out walking. A police officer did drive out to the spot where Rich reported seeing Colin. Some articles say that the officer arrived to the area only 10 minutes after Colin was seen there, but other reports it was more like half an hour to an hour later, which seems more likely. But either way, the officer drove up and down Route 3 for several miles looking, but he didn't see Colin, and I'm sure the officer figured Colin had just gotten a ride. It's unknown if Colin really was expecting a ride from someone. He had made at least one phone call that night trying to get a lift from a friend that lived near Tepper Lake, but he didn't get a hold of the friend, so he left a voice message. Colin didn't sound scared or stressed out or even drunk in the voicemail. He sounded calm and reasonable. If anyone did agree to pick Colin up that night, they have not come forward to say so. That evening and the next morning, I don't think Colin's parents were overly concerned that he didn't come home because Colin did stay overnight at a friend's house occasionally, so they figured that's what he had done. They did try to call his cell phone, but it was going straight to voicemail, and that wasn't really uncommon either because Colin didn't always make sure that his phone was charged. But by Sunday afternoon, when phone calls were made to Colin's friends and none of them knew where he was and Colin still had not appeared or contacted anyone, his parents were obviously very worried. It was very uncharacteristic for Colin to leave or not come home without telling anyone, so they reported him missing at 5.30 p.m. State police and park rangers launched a massive search, and over 1,000 volunteers came out to help find Colin. Divers searched nearby Raquette River and Raquette Pond. Specialized sonar equipment was used to search under the Route 3 bridge above the Piercefield Dam. All nearby waterways were also searched using airboats and sonar. Military helicopters from Fort Drum did aerial searches. Police got articles of Colin's clothing for the search dogs to get a smell off of so they could track him, which I am unsure if they picked up his scent anywhere besides the road. I could not find that information. The area where Colin disappeared was around the Adirondack Forest, and that area is almost as large as Lake Erie. It is huge. It's a pretty rough terrain, but that didn't stop people from being willing to help. Teams walked shoulder to shoulder in lines and did grid searches. They covered well over 2,000 acres and left no stone unturned. 
During the search, they did find Colin's driver's license and his tobacco pipe on the ground where Setting Pole Dam Road connects with Route 3, which is about 1.3 miles from Pascagumbe Road where he first made that left turn. Those are the only items that were found connected to Colin. State police have followed up on almost 500 leads, but no other trace of him has ever been discovered. Now there are lots and lots of theories and rumors in this case. Some believe that he wandered into the woods drunk and succumbed to the elements. He wasn't wearing his coat when he was last seen, even though it was freezing out. He wouldn't have been able to survive in the icy conditions. Hypothermia would have come quickly. Some think maybe he attempted to cross the frozen river and the ice cracked and he subsequently fell in and drowned. Colin's father, though, said that he could not think of any reason why Colin would have gone into the forest. He was experienced in the local terrain. He had been a Boy Scout, and he was familiar with those woods. They did such an extensive and thorough search of that area that I believe they would have found him, or some trace of him if it was a case of him getting lost in the woods or falling in the water. There was a lot of snow on the ground, so... It's possible he could have been buried in it and they couldn't see him, but they did more searching after the snow melted and still found nothing. During hunting season, hunters were encouraged to keep an eye out for any sign of Colin or anything belonging to him, but so far, nothing had been reported. It's also been suggested that maybe he was hit by a car accidentally or even on purpose, and the person who hit him panicked and got rid of his body. Maybe someone was drinking and didn't see Colin walking on the side of the road until it was too late, and they didn't want to call police for help out of fear of getting into trouble. But they didn't find any evidence of this. No blood, no glass, paint chips, or car parts strewn about. If he had been hit, there most likely would have been something, some sign of that on the road. Many people thought that the serial killer Israel Keys could have been involved. If you don't know who Israel Keys is, you can easily find videos about him if you want. There are a ton of them on YouTube. I am not going to go into all the terrible things he did because it's disgusting and he is scum of the earth and he has gotten way too much attention and notoriety already as it is, in my opinion. Um... He's just a terrible person. But people thought Israel may be involved because he owned property there in Franklin County and did spend quite a bit of time there. He even disposed of murder weapons in St. Lawrence County, the next county over. In 2009, Keyes robbed a bank in Tupper Lake and claimed to have disposed of one of his victims around this area. But Israel was not in Tupper Lake or the area during the time Colin disappeared. Also, he was using the debit card of one of his victims in Texas around the time Colin vanished, so it is highly unlikely that he was involved. People questioned whether Rich Rosentrotter, the man who saw Colin walking and reported it to police, could have been involved and reported it to throw police off track. But Rich's story checked out. His times matched up, and he is not suspected to have any involvement. I think he was just trying to do the right thing. Another theory, and the one... I myself think is the most likely is that someone from the party had something to do with it. The party broke up around 1.30, just 30 minutes after Colin left. People leaving the party would have probably seen Colin walking. Did the person who had an altercation with Colin see him walking and decided they wanted to stir up another fight or get revenge? Colin was all alone, walking in the dark, so the opportunity would have been there for someone to snatch him up without anyone witnessing it. It was rumored that Colin got into it at the party with a known bully. This guy had anger issues, a bad rep, and parents who were kind of the same way. Did he take his anger out on Colin when he saw him walking and it just went too far? Did he pull up and act like everything was cool and convince Colin to get in the car and then did something to him? What about Austin Tui, the guy who offered him a ride? Did his story check out? Did Colin really decline his offer of a ride twice? He was questioned by police. The police did interview around 30 people that attended the party, but there were others in attendance that never came forward to speak with law enforcement. Someone posted something on a Reddit thread that was 
kind of interesting to me. I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact words, but they said that a lot of people didn't talk to the police about it back in 2012 because they were threatened with being removed from sports teams if they admitted being at a party with alcohol, so they all refused to speak. That comment really made sense. To some high school kids, their friends in sports are everything. If this is the reason they didn't speak up, though, that's awful. But what about now? Everyone who was in high school then is out. If you were watching this video and you were at that party and you know something, why not speak up now? Sure, people may be mad that you waited almost nine years, but guess what? They're going to be grateful that you're saying something now. I promise you that. Give this family closure. Despite flyers and billboards with Colin's picture being put everywhere, there have been no confirmed sightings of him and there has still been no trace of him. Police haven't been able to rule out foul play and it isn't believed at all that Colin would disappear on his own. He had so much going for him, so many things to look forward to. In November of 2020, so pretty recently, police did follow up on an old tip they had received and they were digging out on a property on County Route 24, also known as Edwards Russell Road in Edwards, New York, which is about 50 miles away from where Colin disappeared. This property is known as the Old Noble Farm and is or was connected to a certain someone that attended the party that night. Police haven't released the name, so I won't either, but if you are searching online, it is not at all hard to find. It is an ongoing investigation, so police haven't released what they found during the dig, if anything, and no arrests have been made. Whoever is responsible for what happened to Colin has gone almost nine years without being punished. This person or persons have gotten to live their life. Maybe they have gotten married, had children, all the things Colin didn't get to do. I always like to have hope that missing people are still out there. However, in this case, I do feel like something nefarious was done to Colin. I really want his family to get closure and whoever is responsible to be found. So many unanswered questions in this case. Why did Colin turn left on Highway 3, the opposite way of home. Was he going to meet someone? Did he think he was being followed and didn't want to lead them to where he lived? Why wasn't he wearing his coat in freezing temperatures? Did he get hurt at the party during the fight? Like, really hurt to where he was confused and having trouble functioning properly? Were there drugs at the party? Did Colin take something or was he slipped something that altered his decision making? If that were the case, he probably wouldn't have sounded so normal in the voicemail, though. You know, the one he left for his friend. And that's just my opinion. But that may explain him flailing his arms about when Rich saw him, because that's something I wonder about also. Why were his driver's license and tobacco pipe found laying on the road? Was there a struggle and he dropped them? Or did Colin leave those items intentionally knowing he was in trouble and wanting to leave a clue behind. I wish we knew. At the time of his disappearance, Colin was six feet tall and weighed 170 pounds. He has blue eyes and blonde hair that was cut in a crew cut style. He was last seen wearing red Nike Air high top sneakers, Levi boot cut jeans, a black leather belt with a metal buckle, and a white with blue stripes American Eagle V-neck shirt. He had with him an orange L.L. Bean backpack and a reversible black and red L.L. Bean coat and a Samsung flip phone. If you have any information on Colin's disappearance, please contact the New York State Police at 518-897-2000. There is a $25,000 reward for information leading to finding Colin. Please do not assume that law enforcement already knows the info you have. If you have even the tiniest detail of that night, let police know. Someone out there knows what happened, and they need to come forward with it. My heart goes out to Colin's family. They deserve answers, and Colin deserves justice if something was done to him. 
I will link his flyer below as well as the link to the Bring Colin Gillis Home Facebook page and the link to a video that his brother Ian made to help bring awareness to the case. As always, I mean absolutely no harm in doing these videos. I am simply trying to bring awareness to the lesser known missing person cases. There may be times when I have my information wrong. I always do post my sources. Um, in the description box. So if I get something wrong, please feel free to politely correct me in the comments as I have no desire to spread false information. Please keep Colin and his family in your prayers, share his flyer, and share this video if you think it will help. Thank you all so much for being here. Please give this video a like so I know these cases are being seen. Subscribe if you would like to support me in getting the lesser known cases out there. Again, I upload a new case every week. Feel free to check out my entire missing playlist as every missing person I cover deserves more attention than they have gotten and we don't want anyone to forget them. That is all for today. I will see you all next week. Bye guys.